was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You are listening to Outer Brightness, a podcast for post-Mormons who are drawn by God to walk with Jesus rather than turn away. Outer brightness, outer brightness, outer brightness, outer brightness. There's no weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth here, except when Michael's hangry, that is, hangry, that is, hangry, that is. Welcome to this episode of the Outer Brightness Podcast. We were all born and raised in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah, more commonly referred to as the Mormon faith. We may use nicknames or abbreviations of the church, such as LDS, Mormon, etc., but not in an attempt to be pejorative or insulting, but as a reflection of our personal experiences as Latter-day Saints, where these terms were used interchangeably in reference to ourselves and or the church. All of us have left that religion and have been drawn to faith in Jesus Christ based on biblical teachings. Some might consider us sons of perdition, the inheritors of outer darkness who supposedly knew the truth and rejected it. The name of our podcast, Outer Brightness, reflects the Gospel of John, chapter 1 in the Bible, specifically verse 9, which calls Jesus the true light, which gives light to everyone. We have found life beyond Mormonism to be brighter than we were told it would be, and the light we have is not our own. It comes to us from without, thus outer brightness. Making the transition from Mormonism to broader Christianity can be exciting, scary, confusing, challenging, and ultimately life-giving. Our aim here is to share our journeys of faith and what God has done in our lives in drawing us to His Son. We'll have conversations about all aspects of that transition, the fears, challenges, new beliefs, surprises, and joys. We're glad you found us, and we hope you'll stick around. I'm Matthew, the nuclear Calvinist. I'm Michael, the ex-Mormon apologist. I'm Paul Bunyan. Let's get into it. Today, we're really going to be focusing on Paul's journey, uh, how he was brought up in the LDS church, what things he that led him out of the church, and what led him to Christ. So we'll be interviewing him, asking him a few questions, and uh, we hope you'll all enjoy what we have to discuss here. So, Paul, starting off, could you just briefly introduce yourself, maybe your, your upbringing, where you were born and raised, that kind of thing? Sure. So uh, I was born of goodly parents in uh, Bountiful, Utah. We lived in North Salt Lake for uh, the first nine years of my life. Uh, those were good times. Uh, the ward that we were in there uh, was the Salt Lake uh, 22nd Ward. And, um, you know, have some good memories of, of growing up there. Parents were, were good members of the church. They, um, my mom comes from a family that uh, goes back in the church generations. I have a, a great-great-grandmother who left Denmark and traveled to America in the 1860s and crossed the plains car- uh, pulling a handcart with her daughter uh, and settled uh, ultimately in uh, Pleasant Grove, Utah. And uh, so, you know, go back to pioneer stock on my mom's side. Uh, and then dad uh, actually was a convert to the LDS faith. He was uh, born and raised as a and christened as a Lutheran in New York. And when uh, he was a young adult, uh, I think he was 26 or so, his dad passed away unexpectedly and that uh, caused him to do some uh, some seeking. And uh, around that time, some Mormon missionaries came knocking on the door uh, and he took that as as a sign and so took lessons from them and uh, eventually ended up joining the LDS church. Uh, spent a few years there uh, in a small branch uh, in upstate New York, baptized my grandmother on that side of the family uh, before finally making the decision to move to Utah. One of the missionaries that that uh, my dad had known there in that small branch in in New York lived in Utah, and when he uh, went home, uh, my dad uh, moved out. Uh, they had become pretty good friends, and my dad moved out to Utah and lived with his parents for a while. Uh, his parents introduced my dad to my mom. They knew 
her because they did uh, genealogical research at uh, the genealogy library in downtown Salt Lake City. And my mom had studied uh, library sciences at BYU in order to become a, a, a professional genealogist and, and do work for people to help them find their ancestors and help them prepare the, the paperwork that, that needed to be done in order to take names to the temple uh, and do baptisms for the dead and other ordinances for the dead that, that LDS do. So this family introduced my parents. They were married about a year later in the Salt Lake Temple in 1975. My sister came along in 1976, and I came along in 78, and uh, have a younger sister born in 81, uh, another younger sister born in 83, and my, my youngest brother is, is the caboose of the family. He was born in 85, so grew up in a stereotypically large Mormon family. When I was nine years old, we moved from North Salt Lake City to out to the suburbs uh, of West Jordan, Utah, and lived there throughout the rest of my adolescence uh, until I served a mission. And then when I came home from my mission, I moved out of state. So that, that, uh, that's briefly my upbringing. Paul, do you mind? I just, uh, I just want to know, because I know you're, you said your family was pretty big into going into the temple. Was that something that you did frequently as well before your mission? It was, yeah. My, so my parents, uh, after we moved out to West Jordan, Utah, uh, they were ordinance workers in the Jordan River Temple. They worked in the baptistry for a number of years. So uh, on Thursday nights, that's what they did. Dad would come home from work. They would both get ready, and they would do a session uh, in the baptistry from uh, typically around 6 o'clock in the evening until after uh, 9 o'clock, almost 10 o'clock some evenings. And... What that entailed uh, was for, you know, the, the various wards there would have their youth go to the temple, uh, have a temple night for doing baptisms for the dead. So there would be five or six wards that would bring their youth through in an evening uh, and do baptisms. And, and so uh, my my older sister and I were old enough that uh, when, when my parents were workers there, uh, we would go with them occasionally on Thursday night. It was a uh, it was an enjoy- it was an enjoyable experience because we got to um, go to the cafeteria in the temple and eat dinner with them. Uh, so it was a nice time to spend together with family with my parents. Um, and then we would we would do these baptisms for the dead. Funny enough, it was it was one of those experiences that kind of got me to start questioning uh, because uh, when when we were there in the temple, people who were there working in the baptistry, it, it wasn't uncommon for for them and, and my parents too, to talk about feeling or seeing the people for whom they were doing the baptisms. And I remember going and, and participating, but never feeling or seeing anyone. And that always had my mind wondering what they were experiencing that I wasn't. So yeah, one of those early experiences that, that got me questioning. Okay, thank you. That sounds like you were brought up from a young age to be a Latter-day Saint then. You were baptized at eight, right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, when we were still living downtown, I was baptized in the the tabernacle that makes the Mormon Tabernacle Choir famous, but I guess they've changed their name, right? So, uh, <laughs> but in any case, there's there's a baptistry in, in, the, in the basement of, of the, the famous tabernacle there on Temple Square. And that's where our stake would would perform its baptisms. So when I was eight years old, I did I I was baptized there, and it it was an interesting experience. You know, I've ri- I've written about it as an adult, and I I described it as joining a men's club. And the reason I described it that way is is that you know when I was younger, uh, we used to go to what was called the Northwest Multipurpose Center, sort of like the YMCA type of place. Um, that's where my sister and I took. Uh, swimming lessons. And so we would go over there on Tuesday nights and, and do swimming lessons. And then when we were done, uh, my dad would take me into the into the men's changing room. Uh, my, my mom would take my sister into the to the women's uh, changing room and we would we would change. And, and often my dad and I would go into the sauna room that was there. I don't know if, if you all remember or have ever experienced a, a sauna room, but um, you know, it's it's basically people sitting around with towels wrapped around them, and you you open the door and step inside and and uh, dip a ladle of hot water onto 
hot lava rocks to create steam and you sit around and sweat. <laughs> it's, um, it used to be, I think, more popular than it is now, but um, uh, that's that's what we would do after you know swimming lessons on Tuesday night. And I remember it was just a strange experience going into that sauna room with, with other men uh, who were mostly naked, <laughs> except for a towel. And uh, I remember going into the basement baptistry changing room uh, in the tabernacle and it, it, it felt like a similar experience, you know, changing and, and getting ready. And, and uh, my friends from school were there because they were also being baptized. And one of the kids was kind of a jerk at school. And I was surprised to see him there, but he was being baptized. So we were all part of the same club. And so it was, I don't know, it was, it was weird. It was, uh, it was like joining a club. As you were growing up and you were a member of the church, what were some of the positive experiences that you had while you were a member? You had mentioned uh, your experiences in the baptistry. You'd mentioned some positive experiences there. So what are some other positive experiences that you had? Yeah, so... You know, the, the LDS church used to be very involved with the, the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts. Uh, when I was younger, um, I did that, uh, went all through Cub Scouts. Uh, I, I, I'm not an Eagle Scout. I reached a point in my life where uh, other things were more important to me than, than scouting. But uh, early on when I was a Cub Scout, I uh, would go to camps, you know, day camps in the summertime and shoot arrows and uh, make leather work. Uh, in fact, I, I came across a uh, a piece of leather work that I had done at one of those camps when I was a kid uh, the other day when I was going through some things that my mom had given me a few years back. And, you know, those those experiences were fun. You know, just, uh, I don't know, I, I, I kind of loved everything about scouting. I loved camping. I loved being around other other guys and everything about it except going after the awards, uh, going after the merit badges. So, yeah, got got to a point where the the chase of that just wasn't as important, but I would definitely say the scouting is one of those positive experiences that that I had within the LDS church. Another one I would say is uh, I remember there used to be a, a real effort to do things that were fun but also educational. So I remember a Christmas. I guess I guess it was a Christmas party, but. Um, they, whoever was in charge of it, planned it really well, and they they decked out the gym in the church like it was Jerusalem. And the whole idea was that that you would spend the evening in in uh, or I guess Bethlehem in Bethlehem uh, that you would spend the evening in Bethlehem where the Savior was born. And um, you know they had. Uh, I, I don't know how authentic the food was, but they had pitas full of, uh, you know, meat and stuff. So they tried to make it as authentic as it as it could be. Uh, and and for me as a kid, I thought that that's kind of cool, you know, it uh, that the lights were turned down in the gym and they they put up props that looked like shops in in what you might might uh, imagine uh, ancient Bethlehem to look like. So that that was kind of cool. There's there's not as much effort put into that kind of thing these days, I don't think, but. Uh, that was a positive experience. I was gonna say, I know some of your story because I've I've talked to you in the past about it, and I think you said that after some time after your mission, you were I guess in the elders quorum and and you were involved in teaching and and things of that nature as well. Was that mm-hmm. for for a while? How was that experience for you? Yeah, so I I held a number of callings uh, here in Kentucky after I moved here. Uh, one of them was, was ward mission leader, spent a few years, uh, within the young men's organization in the ward, uh, and also, uh, a number of years, uh, within the elders quorum presidency, helping to run that organization and, and also teaching, uh, on a regular basis within that organization. I, gu- I guess I should step back a little bit and talk about my mission. So as a, as a teenager, uh, I kind of fell away from activity in the church. Um, I kind of alluded to the fact that there were things that became more important to me than scouting. And and the the thing that I'm talking about there is, is basketball. So when I, when I was a teenager, I got into playing basketball with some friends of mine. When we moved to, to West Jordan, Utah, uh, you know, I was the new kid in school and, uh, you know, got to know some friends. And, and, and one of the things that I noticed pretty quickly about uh, the ward that I moved into in West Jordan is that um, 
it was, it was pretty clickish, and that that remained that way uh, throughout the time that we were there. I know my family felt it. Some other families felt it. Um, and that's not to say that there weren't good people in that ward. You both know that that Mormon wards are are they can be very they can be very kind, but they can also be unforgiving for some people. And so, and I I would say that probably uh, my struggles socially as a teenager were were probably related to my falling away from regular activity within the church. Um, so I, I, I don't hold <laughs> any of those people, uh, that I grew up with, uh, uh, to too high a standard in that regard. I think they, they, you know, given what Mormonism teaches about, um, you know, being in the chosen generation and, and that type of thing, uh, I think they were, they were kind of beholden to what they were receiving, but, you know, there, there were some times when it was difficult as a, as a teenager to, to feel like I was a part of things. And so I kind of drifted away, like I said, and, and spent more time focusing on playing basketball. I played, uh, both for my middle school and for my high school and was fairly successful at that throughout those years. Um, and one of the things that my mom would always say to me because it, it, it was clear to her that that was becoming a passion of mine. And I, you know, I wanted to play at the college level. And so she would always say to me that there are two years of your life that don't belong to you. They belong to God and you need to give those years to him. And we would, you know, we would sometimes argue a little bit about that because I really wanted to go on and play college basketball. But, you know, as, as a, as a loyal son does, uh, I took her, her guidance to heart. And so, uh, when, when the bishop of my ward called me in and, and asked me uh, if I had intentions on serving a mission, I told him yes, even though I didn't really uh, want to do it. And so uh, that started the process of, of preparing uh, papers for uh, going on a mission. And, uh, you know, both of you know that that, uh, that process can, depending on how busy your bishop is, that process can take some time. Um, there's, there's things to be done, you know, medical forms to be filled out by your doctor, dental forms to be filled out, all of that. So started working through that process, uh, in the, uh, spring of 1997. And during the time that, uh, I was working on my papers and, and actually had them all ready to turn in the night before uh, I had an appointment with the stake president for a final interview before the papers would be submitted. I was out with a friend and we were, we had gone to a pool hall, uh, which was not uncommon for, not, un, not an uncommon thing for us to do, uh, on a Saturday night. We'd go to the pool hall and, and, and play pool for a few hours. And we were there and, uh, some people that we knew from school came in, uh, from our high school and they had, a smuggled uh, drink. They had a 44-ounce drink from a gas station uh, that they had doctored uh, with some alcoholic beverages. And they offered me and my friend uh, a drink. And so here I am on the, on the eve of the final interview with my stake president, getting ready to turn to my mission papers, and, and I'm taking a, a, a swig out of an alcoholic beverage. And uh, so the next day, Next morning, got up, uh, felt incredibly guilty uh, for having done that, didn't get drunk, took a couple of swallows of, of, of uh, an alcoholic beverage, and then went home. But um, felt incredibly guilty the next morning, so confessed that to my stake president and uh, kind of got a brow beating from him. He basically said, you know, that I needed to, to go home and, and, and pray and think about whether a mission was something I really wanted to do and that we would have to delay submitting my mission papers for, uh, for some time. Um, so that delayed, uh, the submission of my mission papers for a couple of months. During that time, I was, uh, working at the, the same company where my dad was working. I was testing, uh, microchips to make sure that they were, uh, within specifications for what they were needed for for the device that they were being uh, put in. And um, I was sitting there, you know, just absentmindedly putting these microchips into the tester, pressing the test button, letting it go through its process, pulling them out, putting the next one in, and sitting there realizing uh, that I had never read the Book of Mormon all the way through 
uh, yet I was full on in the midst of preparations for going on a mission. I had certainly read parts of the Book of Mormon. Um, I had graduated from LDS Seminary, uh, even though I uh, <laughs> had spent uh, a good portion of time uh, skipping third period seminary to right. go to breakfast with friends to the point where one of my teachers had to, had to make me the class president to try to get me to come to class. But in any case, I, I had read quite a bit of, of the Book of Mormon, but I had never read it all the way through. Um, and I had certainly never done Moroni's promise to get down on my knees and pray about it. So sitting at work there that one day, thinking about that and realizing, you know, I probably should uh, make a serious effort to read it all the way through. And so I started to do that uh, day by day would uh, read uh, and and actually would <laughs> uh, m- much of my uh, work day was was pretty monotonous testing microchips like that or, or doing you know other things that uh, you know you would repetitively that you would do something and then there would be a process of waiting a few minutes for that that process to complete and then doing that thing over again and so I, I started reading the the Book of Mormon while I was testing the microchips. <laughs> thinking that I might, if I if I was seen by anybody, I might get in trouble. But the uh, president of the company was was a stake president, so um, he he actually did catch me reading it and was like, "Oh, good, good, good for you." <laughs> so um, I I still did not get all the way through before my mission, and so finished finished it reading finished reading it through the first time uh, while I was in the NTC, but. But before I went um, and before I submitted my papers, I did uh, decide that I would would follow uh, the promise in Moroni chapter 10. Uh, got down on my knees uh, in uh, my parents' living room in West Jordan uh, after spending an hour or so reading one one night late and and prayed to know if the Book of Mormon was true, if uh, Joseph Smith was a prophet, and thought I felt something like warm water come over my body, uh, radiating out of my chest, and um, thought to myself, that was a strange experience. And I remember staying there on my knees for a long time, trying to understand what that was. And I realized that if I slowed my breathing down and really kind of focused all my attention on my chest and then... And it's interesting because as, as a Latter-day Saint, uh, at least when I was growing up, I don't know how much, I've been out of the church for almost 10 years now, so I don't know how much it's emphasized now. But when I was growing up, it was really emphasized that if you prayed about the Book of Mormon, you would receive a burning in the bosom. So the witness that I received was exactly what I'd been told I would receive countless times. And I stayed there on my knees for the longest time and realized eventually that if I slowed my breathing enough and focused my energy and my, my attention on my chest, that I could kind of recreate that radiation feeling. And that bothered me. Um, and it bothered me to the point that I continued to pray for a witness of the Book of Mormon uh, throughout the entire time that I was in the MTC, uh, throughout the entire two years that I was on my mission, even up until the very last area of my mission. I was still praying for a witness that I couldn't explain away. And so uh, eventually did submit my papers, received a call to serve in the Budapest Hungary mission, um, spent uh, about half of my time in country in Budapest uh, in various areas. Budapest is actually two cities uh, that are on opposite sides of the Danube River. Uh, Buddha is on one side, on the, the side of the river that has more uh, of the hills, and Pesht is on the other side, the opposite side of the river. It's it's a flatter area. I served in three areas in Budapest. Uh, well, during my time there, I spent uh, a number of months in a small city uh, out by the Ukrainian border called Nidachaza, and then I spent uh, a few months uh, in a in a college town um, near the the border uh, of Hungary and the and the former Yugoslavia uh, that that city is called Seged. Mission was a great experience. I learned discipline. I learned study habits. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, interpersonal relationships and, and and learning to get along with people. Um, 
So I uh, enjoyed my mission, but um, definitely throughout my mission, like I said, I was I was I was aware that although I was there to teach, and I often told people when when they would ask me, you know, because people people are generally surprised that a 19 year old would spend two years of their life preaching uh, rather than you know doing other things that 19 year olds typically do. Um, and so I would often get asked why, why I did what I did. And, you know, I, I often went back to what my, what my mom told me, you know, that, uh, uh these two years are not mine. Uh, they are, they are dedicated to God. And so I had to give them to him. And so that's the way I viewed it. That's the, that's the way I viewed what I was doing. But I was aware of the fact that in some sense, I felt like I was a fraud because, uh, I was going out to tell people that, that this book and this prophet were true, and I wasn't sure that I believed that myself, or, and I was certain that I didn't have a witness of it. So uh, towards the end of my mission, we were teaching, I'll say a family, but we mostly taught the wife. Um, the husband was not very interested. They had both been... Uh, I would say burned by religion and had come out of uh, Christianity and were considered the, had considered themselves atheists. Uh, he was much more strident in that than she was. She was still open to seeking, which is why she met with us with his permission. Um, and so we would, we would meet with her on a, on a weekly basis. She did eventually end up getting baptized into the LDS faith and I spent several months uh, at the very end of my mission uh, just pleading with God to make that family whole and bring the whole family into the church and went to a uh, the, the, the branch where I was um, there in Budapest. There was a, uh, a branch of U.S. Expa- expatriates who were working uh, for various companies over there in Budapest. Uh, and were largely only English speakers, didn't speak Hungarian. And there was a, a gentleman who was in that, that English speaking branch who, for whatever reason, our mission president decided to call as the branch president of the Hungarian branch that, uh, that we were serving in. And so we went to, uh, a branch get together at his house, his home there. And, uh, this family that we were teaching, including the husband came and, got to kind of witness a, a discussion between this, this American businessman and, and this Hungarian husband and father that I'd been praying for and listen to um, this, uh, this man just be completely uh, authentic in describing his disbelief. And it affected me. It, uh, the way he was able to be honest even though his family was was going a different direction, uh, it affected me. Uh, it it made me realize that maybe I was pretending a little bit, a lot, and it made me question a lot of things. And so I spent the last few months of my uh, mission in kind of a weird space uh, in my head and in my heart, where uh, I was just really wanting Mormonism to be true. Um, but I was pretty certain that it wasn't. Um, but I imagined myself, so I would sit on my bed and read the Book of Mormon, and I would think about how there was no archaeological evidence for it. And I'd always just accepted that it's true, but there was no evidence for it. And so I'd sit and daydream on my bed during morning study that I would go home and study at BYU and become an archaeologist and go to Central America and find the ruins, I would find the artifacts that would prove the Book of Mormon to be true. And that's that's the kind of thing that I, <laughs> I was daydreaming about uh, in the final months of my mission. But one of the other things that I was wrestling with is that I, I had reached a point where I was reading. So I, I had made, I'd set myself a goal that not only would I finish the Book of Mormon, but I During the time that I was on my mission, I would read all of the LDS standard works. So Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Old Testament, New Testament. And in those final months of my mission, I had gotten to the point where I was reading the New Testament and I was reading through the epistles of Paul. And 
they were blowing me away with some of the things that he was saying because it didn't fit. And I remember being on the bus and reading through the epistles of Paul and thinking to myself, I might not be saved. And I went home that night and for the next few weeks through the end of my mission, my prayer was for God to save me. And strangely enough, I started praying to Jesus, which you don't do in the LDS faith. You pray to God in the name of Jesus. And so, um, but I would just kneel by my bed and, and plead with Jesus to be my savior and to save me. And then I came home and um, I went back to Utah and put on the good face that uh, everything was was great. Mission was a success. Uh, and by all uh, measures of, of a Mormon uh, mission in Eastern Europe, it, 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 uh, I would say I was fairly successful. Um, there, there were a number of people who, who joined the church uh, as a result of me having contact with them, not just me, but my companions as well. And so, you know, came home and felt like uh, even though I was in a weird headspace, uh, I had been a successful missionary. Um, but there was a lot of pressure to um, to fit in the 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 social uh, the social ladder of Mormonism. You're a returned missionary now, and so now it's time to find a bride and, and get married in the temple and start having kids. And um, I was home in Utah, and that uh, all of that just terrified me. Let me ask you a question back to the mission real quick, because you said you were praying quite a bit to get a spiritual witness. And I know a lot of times, especially in foreign missions, uh, missionaries will take the fact that they were able to learn a language uh, as as like the gift of tongues or like a miracle. Did you have other experiences that you were kind of grappling with, maybe like that, that you were we're arguing against yourself, like maybe you had had like a different kind of a witness. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. Um, so there were times when, uh, so uh, Elder Charles Didier was our district president at the time. So a couple of times during my uh, time in Hungary, he came from, I think he was uh, stationed in either either Frankfurt or or somewhere in France. I can't remember exactly where he was stationed uh, during that time, but um, he would come and speak uh, either at a district conference or um, there. But there was one time that he uh, he came to speak, and Elder Earl C. Tini came to speak uh, at the small uh, branch house where I was serving. So I was in my third area of my mission. Let's see, first area was about four months, second area was five months, no, second area was four months. So I was I was maybe nine or ten months in the country when Elder T came to speak uh, to the membership. And uh, normally they would have native Hungarians translate. Uh, but there I don't recall exactly what happened, but there was there there was something that happened that uh, that you know they would have uh, when when Sister T would speak, they would have a uh, a female native Hungarian speak, uh, translate for her, and then they would have a, a male uh, native Hungarian speaker translate for uh, the general authority who was speaking. Um, I don't recall exactly what happened, but I was asked to translate for, for Elder T that evening, which was incredibly nerve-wracking, uh, but I got up and I did it, and I remember being told by the native speaker who had done the translation for Sister to me that uh, there was nothing about my translation that was off, that it was uh, exactly as she would have done it if she had been translating for him. It's incredible. Uh, so, yeah, I took things like that as as evidence that uh, uh, I was in God's good graces, that, that, that what I was doing was, was meant to be. You were previously talking about your return home from your mission. And how you were kind of having to put on this mask to to kind of hide your true feelings or your, your true experiences from your mission. Mm-hmm. Um, so did this continue going on, or did you did you feel like you ever had that witness that you were hoping for, or or did it kind of just continue on the same path that you had started? So um, yeah, the mask. Um, 
So while while I was in the MTC, and, and this is to answer your question, I'm not I'm not going to back up too much. But while I was in the MTC, I was struggling with this as well because uh, I, I I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't recall exactly when the missionary materials were changed, but, but we still use the old missionary guide when I was in the missionary training center. And so um, if you if you all are familiar with that, there was role play, right? You would um, you would take turns with the other uh, missionaries in your group who were going to the same country or going to the same mission. Uh, two of you would pretend to be a couple taking the discussions, and the other two of you would pretend to be the missionaries giving the discussions. And you would practice delivering your memorized discussions uh, to the other missionaries and then you know you would get to a certain point in the in the missionary guide where it would instruct you to testify of uh, Jesus Christ or testify of Joseph Smith or testify of the Book of Mormon and I remember one evening doing that uh, in a role play there in the MTC uh, testifying of the Book of Mormon and my companion, got tears in his eyes and I was just taken aback by that because we were just role playing. Right. And I didn't really feel like I had a witness. I was still getting down uh, on my knees by my bedside each night and and praying for that witness uh, so that he would, the fact that he would be moved by my testifying was a little uh, upsetting to me. And uh, later that night when we had gone back to our dorms, uh, he asked if he could speak to me in private. So we went out from our dorm room to get away from the other two elders that, that were in there and sat out in in, the, in kind of the common area under the stairs. And he told me that he had, he had a really strong knowledge, and he was right about this, a really strong knowledge of LDS church doctrine and teachings. And he had read the Book of Mormon. And he, had, you know, he was much more doctrinal, doctrinally astute than I was at that point. But he told me that he had never had a witness of the Book of Mormon and that when I had testified, uh, he could just tell that I had and it, it made him, uh, sad and jealous. And that's what he was experiencing in that moment in the classroom earlier in the evening. And I, <laughs> that just really messed with my head because I didn't have a witness and here he was supposedly moved by my witness um and so that 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 just messed with me so i talked to uh one of our instructors about it the next day told him it was bothering me and he gave me uh, a talk by boyd k packer uh called the candle of the lord and in that talk uh other packer basically recommended that um the witness would come uh the testimony would come through the bearing of it that uh, if you, if you bore your testimony in faith, you would get the witness, even if you hadn't received it yet. Um, and he goes into quite some detail talking about, you know, that trying, trying to kind of dance around the idea that, that doing so would be lying. Um, but basically said, you know, it's kind of like the fake until you make an idea. And so that's, that's kind of the philosophy that I went into my mission with was that, you know, okay, I don't have this witness. I want to believe. Uh, and I'm going to testify as best I can and hope that that witness comes. And, you know, eventually I'd, I got to the point where uh, I just started going back to the witness I talked about before. I started going back to that, that feeling of, of warmth radiating out, radiating out from my chest. And so that's what I would describe when I would talk about the witness. And I did that all the way up through probably like 2008 both during and, and, and after my mission. And uh, eventually we were in, in elders quorum studying through uh, the teachings of the prophets, series of books that, that uh, used to be studied in, in uh, elders quorum and relief society. And uh, I think it was David O. McKay. And there is a part in, in, in that book where he describes uh, going out into a field, riding a horse out into a field, to, you know, as, as a young man, to pray about the Book of Mormon himself. And he talks about, you know, that he uh, realized that when he got up off of his knees that day, that he was the same boy he was before, uh, basically meaning that he had not received a witness or anything spectacular 
in his time of prayer that there that day. And he goes on to explain that his witness has come to him in the performance of his duty. And so when I when I saw that experience uh, from David O. McKay, who went on to become the president and prophet of the LDS Church, uh, it kind of made me realize, well, if he never received a witness, maybe I never will, even though I'm trying to describe one that I know I can recreate. Um, so yeah, I, I, I did never receive anything that I thought was something that I couldn't recreate. Wow. I'm trying to process all that. That's a lot of great stuff. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Outer Brightness Podcast here on our YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. We hope to upload more episodes in the future. We also have a Facebook page and would appreciate it if you liked it and followed us there. And we also have a Facebook group where you can join to discuss the podcast with the co-hosts, fellow friends, and followers of the podcast. We hope to talk to you in the future. Stay bright, Fireflies! You can subscribe to the Outer Brightness Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Google Play, CastBox, Podbean, Spotify, and Stitcher. If you like what you hear, give us a rating or review wherever you listen. Thank you, Fireflies. You can also connect with Michael the Ex-Mormon Apologist at FromWaterToWine.org, where he blogs, and sometimes Paul and Matthew do as well. Music for the Outer Brightness podcast is graciously provided by the talented Brianna Flournoy and by Adams Road. Learn more about Adams Road at www.adamsroadministry.com.